Uh, my name is Neil Kirkwood. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Landscape Architecture, uh, and I'm delighted to welcome you all here tonight uh, to the public lecture presented by the department. Uh, as a number of you recognize, I'm deputizing tonight uh, for a chair, Charles Waldheim, and in fact, and the program director, uh, Christian Worthman, who are both at the, in Rio just now. I hope they're safe. Uh, at the IFLA conference, the International Federation of Landscape Architects uh, conference. And so uh, it's my duty again to um, uh, introduce uh, tonight's speaker, Elko Hoffman, uh, a landscape architect from, uh, that's based in Edinburgh, Scotland, uh, but with an international reputation and a corresponding body of work. Uh, he's a founding partner with the Bridget Baines of Gross Max, landscape architects uh, based in Edinburgh, but he's also a reader at the Edinburgh College of Art. A reader, I think, is equivalent of a senior lecturer, if I'm not mistaken. Equiv oh, he just resigned. Uh, hot news. And, and, but uh, one thing I can say with confidence, he's currently a, a visiting design critic here at the GSD uh, teaching an options studio this fall. And Elko integrates the theory and practice of landscape architecture in an intensive output of professional work and award-winning competition designs. And these include a variety of projects in London, including the Royal Festival Hall, uh, Potter's Field Park, adjacent to Tower Bridge, uh, Brixton Town Square, and overseas, Alco collaborates on a range of projects with Zaha Hadid architects, including the BMW plant in Leipzig, a high-speed railway station in Naples, an urban master plan, for 64 hectares of former dockland along the river Nervion in Boba, and uh, currently at 120 hectare uh, spiritual center on the periphery of Tokyo. Uh, other projects include uh, Rotten Row Gardens in Glasgow, the external spaces of the new Bullring in Birmingham, the Lyric Square in Hammersmith, London, and a series of streetscapes commissioned by the Corporation of London. And finally, also a master plan for the Royal Botanic Gardens in Kew. All these projects uh, embrace creativity uh, with a combination of what's described as a British humor, uh, a Dutch sense of experimentation, and a German sense of rigor for detail and construction. And he has, uh, in recent years, received three Art for Architecture awards by the Royal Society of Arts. And his work has been published in major books on contemporary landscape architecture. And in January, significantly in 2007, Gross Max uh, was awarded the European Landscape Architecture Award organized by Topos, uh, the International Review of Landscape Architecture and Urban Design. And this award recognizes a landscape architecture practice for work that stands on the one hand for the design approach of a single country and on the other that exercises an international influence. But I think that uh, Tis Schroeder writing in the publication Contemporary Landscape Architecture in Europe comes close to the spirit, to the rationale, and the methods of Alcor and Grossmax in their thinking and production of landscape design. And I'm just going to quote a little bit from uh, some of the writing. In, in a piece titled A Change of Scenery, he writes, quote, they are landscape architects who like to talk straight. Their designs and explanations are as open as, the, as they are lucid. They are passionate about confronting the public and proclaiming ideas in the form of images or words. And their answers are as comprehensive as they are provocative, often too provocative for a public that looks for peace of mind in gardens and landscape. Grossmax does not offer relief, but something to chew on mentally. Grossmax demands a Pandora's box full of metropolitan sensual delights. Why suffocate, Alco states, in an overdose of chlorophyll if we can boost our level of adrenaline instead? Question mark. Parks should not be spread over cities like a green stain. On the contrary, they should be confined to special designated sanctuaries. The park is a hunting ground for the contemporary citizens. The city is seen as an event. 
the park as a cultural and traditional domain for hedonistic pleasures. And this is not all about horticultural extravaganzas, but about new approaches to defining public spaces. Maybe because the landscape discipline is, at least in Britain, seen as the odd man out, Alco is invited to collaborate with artists. Artists in general, he notes, seem to operate more within an oeuvre and bring certain ideas to a site which we, how we tend to respond to what is already there. It's the difference between a conceptual and a contextual approach. And for example, in the collaboration with light artist Adam Barker Mill in Glasgow, we see the result of a strong mutual affinity with minimalism resulting in a seamless integration of art and architecture. The project with Mark Dion at Earth Center will no doubt be completely different. This collaboration is, after all, the result of a blind date with all the potential pitfalls and excitements. Meeting Mark for the first time, he states, on an early morning train down south was the most definitive mo mo moment in the whole process of collaboration. It was ideas at first sight. With that, I'd ask you to welcome Elko Hoffman. It's, it's uh, quite good, uh, quite surreal to listen to your own lecture. So, so we, we all can go to the pub. The only thing that was missing was, were the images, so I, I just show you the images. That, that. Cross Max. Right, uh, yes, I'm teaching here as, a, as one of the studio options. Uh, it's a group of landscape architects. And it's, it's quite, quite interesting and quite revealing that my group of, of, of landscape architects, they're situated at the bottom of the pile. They're literally on, on the first floor. And they're being overtowered by this overdose and this uh, full of aspiration and towering egos of all those architects <laughs> in this building. And this is, of course, Hilbesmeyer. It's quite interesting. Charles, who is now having a party in Rio, uh, Charles Waldheim, the new, uh, the new chair, he's actually a scholar on on Charles, on, 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 on Hildesmeyer. So, uh, what's your case? I'm more from this uh, generation, you know, uh, landscape architect, you know, slightly more down to earth, slightly more relaxed, slightly more thinking about time and process. <laughs> However, it's a, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great time for us because uh, obviously, this is Europe, and it's fantastic to, to watch Europe at night by satellite because you don't see any political boundaries. But what you also see is that the whole of Europe is, is becoming one urban constellation. And I think him, he, us, the landscape architects, has a great, great task to play to, uh, to shape the urban fabric. Or task or field of op operation is the urban, urban condition. First, some uh, sentimental journey. This is my hometown in the, in the Netherlands, uh, before I went it, into exile into Scotland. Uh, it's the city of Haarlem, and the painting is by Ruisdael, 17th century. And I really like this painting because it, it, it shows the, how landscape and townscape are already been intertwined in one construct. And that if you're looking to the, to the bleaching of the linen on, on those fields, it's already a kind of the jumut geometry of the town superimposed on the landscape. And of course, I like those pregnant skies, you know, two thirds of pink back skies and the punctuations by the churches. And my God, if you live in Holland, you have to believe in God. After all, you are about five meters below sea level. <laughs> or you have to be a true optimist like myself and you just stick it out. Um, what I'd like you to do is I, I take you in, inside that big church in the, in the center of the slide. And this is a painting by Sarendam. And here, of course, we see a Dutch Protestant church. Uh, and we see the architecture, which is all about light and, and the, sheer, uh, the sheer essence of space itself. But still quite humanistic with the movable piece of furniture, the, the child, the doggy. Uh, 
and, and the kind of asymmetric perspective of the painting. And another painting, uh, looking uh, back towards the church from the town hall. So this is the civic space. This is about the politics, religion, and commerce. And the reason why I show you all those paintings is that I think it explains the field of operation of the landscape architect, in, uh, which is from the land to the scape, the scape of townscape, uh, all the way down to the scale of architecture itself. And to be a landscape architect, you should be able to, to zoom in and zoom out and seamlessly kind of move towards, uh, throughout those scales. And that really makes it different from most architects who are kind of split off from the, from the urban designers. Uh, so architects know how to build buildings but don't know how to plan cities. And urbanists know how to plan cities but not how, uh, they cannot design any longer. I think the landscape architect can reconcile those opposites. Painting by uh, Vermeer, another classic, and it's quite intriguing that many of those paintings, and there are not that many left, uh, it's only about 20 of Vermeer's paintings, uh, they have the map of Holland in the background. It's like a secret code, a kind of geographic disposition uh, of, of where we are, but also, also the proud uh, and, and, and the idea that the, that the country is a project. And, and here we're seeing an update. It's quite interesting to see the difference. Um, sorry, I lost my microphone and I lost my slides. So, sorry. Um, because what you see is the amount of uh, of water turned into into land, and it's an ongoing ongoing project. Yeah. Okay, I'm being... Huh? Okay. Sorry about that. Back wide up. And of course, this ongoing project, this is already a painting, again, a 17th century painting of Amsterdam, where we see a fantastic integration of the man-made landscape and the man-made city. And uh, the Dutch landscape, the landscape which I'm brought up with and, and being educated in, is a kind of completely man-made construct, a work of art where every square centimeter, I promise you, is being discussed, is being planned, is being written about, and probably swapped around every 20 years. That's the kind of lifespan, average lifespan of a Dutch landscape. And uh, that's the result, a kind of, you know, complete schizophrenic idea about our own history. Of course, it takes a German, and I don't know what you know about Germans, but there are good Germans and bad Germans. Uh, <laughs> it's a lesson in history here. Yeah. <laughs> this is a good one. This is Joseph Beuys, uh, the artist. And, and he, he was a great guy, and he made a fantastic statement about the Dutch landscape. Basically, he said, uh, and I quote him, not myself, he said, you Dutch, you fucked it up big time. Uh, you, you have reclaimed so much land out of the sea that you lost your liquid mirror. You lost the reflective quality of that Dutch landscape. And since you have reclaimed all that land and you, and you lost that quality, you have not produced any visual art of any particular interest. So bang, just hit the dirt where it really hurts, you know, below the belt. Um, and I think he got an interesting point uh, to make. Uh, and here we're singing uh, uh, the place uh, close where I have my own house in the Netherlands. It's uh, the battle of the uh, reclamation of the land out of the sea. And just to prove a point, and this is for the first time, actually, I just put this together this afternoon. This is a very, painting, very famous painting by Hobbema, Landje van Middelhaarnes. And... Uh, I got a student working in this area, I've never been there before, and the student showed me uh, the exact location where this painting was being painted 300 years before. And here it is. Well, if you call that progress, I think Joseph Boyce has a point. Holland becomes a kind of mediocreness in full extent. So yes, I have a love-hate relationship with my own background. Um, and I had the feeling, as a young landscape architect, I had to escape. Um, I, I couldn't 
longer stick to the straitjacket of functionalism. And I wanted to embrace the sublime, the idea, the notion that landscape could be about emotion, it could be about philosophy, it could be about art, all those things which were like forbidden fruits uh, in a Dutch context. And when we started the Gross Max office in, in 1996, we didn't have any work. Now that is fantastic. And I, I only can hope that the economic crisis will do the same to me and to all of you. Uh, because if you don't have any work and you have ambition, the only thing you can do is write, to think, read, and that's fantastic. And, and so we started, to, <laughs> we started to make a kind of statements about how we positioned ourselves in the, in, the, in the British context. And uh, I was very interested in, in the 17th century, 18th century British landscape. The idea that landscape uh, was about aesthetic experiment, uh, was a testing ground, uh, it was a landscape of hermits and poets and dandies, the cult of the cultivar, the art of the artifact. And uh, we believe that a lot of that was kind of lost in the 20th century when landscape became translated with the word environment, and like, where, where something which used to be that delicate green tissue became, became that monstrous green blanket. And we were inspired by... by weirdos like the Surrealists. This is a group of André Breton who rediscovered some of the folly, uh, folly gardens in the outskirts of Paris, like Le Désert de Retz. And we started to make sense of our hometown, Edinburgh. Now, Edinburgh is a fantastic classical city in terms of how, how townscape relates to, to, to the topography. And of course, you got the old town on, on top of the volcanic plug with the castle, tumbling down along, the, uh, al along that uh, ridge up to the palace. Very classic example of organic town growth, uh, constrained to the, uh, to the topography, so it's very dense and, and relatively quite high. And then opposite the valley, we've got the fantastic extension of the Enlightenment new town. This was the area of David Hume and Adam Smith, uh, the philosophers, and... Um, and and this new idea about living in nature uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a contrast between the rom Romanticism and the Classical. And even more interesting in this town is that the center of the city is owned by the Queen, is that lump of wilderness uh, on top of the slide called Arthur's Seat. And my theory, this is the only pristine wilderness left in Scotland. If you go to Scotland, please don't. It's just boring, full of tea rooms and you know, shops where you buy woody jumpers. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, really, it's really, really quite banal. Uh, but, but the real true wilderness you find in the city center, and that is fascinating. Uh, so we did, we did a little study uh, for this town as part of an exhibition. Uh, and we started to compare the city, uh, the, this, this, this contrast as the left-hand side of the brain and the right-hand side of the brain, where you have the, the different feel for space and, and organization. And, and true enough, our office is exactly on this kind of borderline between the two halves of the brains. So if I'm in my own office, behind my own drawing board, I stand literally between these uh, different uh, opposite forces of rational enlightenment and the dark forces of the, uh, the organic medieval city. So we wrote a book as part of this exhibition called Old Town, New Town, No Town. And it's being presented like the wrapped in red books. In a, it's a one-off one book in letter bound. And it's, it's, it's completely uh, uh, inspired by an old travelogue. Uh, it's, so it's a kind of takes the graphics and takes the, the, la the kind of writing, but it only, it's, it's a full of tongue-in-cheek manifesto about our own town and some of the images. And, and, and here the, the idea was that this, this lump of wilderness in the city center, that we should reinstate wild animals, uh, lost wild animals like wolves and bears, right bang, and uh, hardcore nature in our city center. And what a wonderful excitement that could bring with holding wolves right, right there in the center. And this is Scottish Parliament, designed by Enric Miralles, which is, uh, in our proposition, uh, a garden folly. 
But it's also a serious aspect of this study, where we're going to the outskirts, and I don't know if you know Annaborough, it's, it's not all rosy, it's also the city of Irvin Wells, train spotting, the drugs capital of Europe. Uh, so we did some hardcore studies about some of those aspects. And critical remarks about the rubber stamp housing, which makes every place like a look-alike. And yes, little dreams as well, because I quite like Britain because of its eccentricity. And, and one of the beauties about Britain was, of course, fox hunting, you know, which is not longer al allowed, which is, you know, uh, very sad for, for British culture. But I dream at least once a year to have an urban fox hunt uh, in, a, in, a, in the suburbs of Edinburgh. Because foxes are not stupid. They don't live in the countryside, for God's sake. They live in the suburbs. They live in the cities. So if you do a fox hunt, it should be a suburban fox hunt. So this became part of an exhibition, and how do you exhibit a book? Um, the only thing we could think of is to make a big bookshelf or a piece of furniture inspired by the painting of Saint Jerome, who went himself to the wilderness and, and built this, uh, this fantastic structure in the, in the Renaissance church, so, or Le Corbusier, which is a study of quiet research. So we, built, we literally built the, the, the thing, and that became the, uh, the context, like a cabinet of curiosity to display that book, and the visitor, and this exhibition went to Florence and different places in Europe, the visitor would be a, a kind of protagonist, uh, a player into, into the uh, exhibition as well, uh, by reading the book. Now, sometimes people ask me, why don't you build, because you know, in the introduction, we seem to build on, on quite a lot of places, but we never do any projects in Edinburgh. And recently somebody asked me, why don't you build in your hometown or your adopted hometown? And I really had to think hard about that. And the only thing I could think of is by saying that we are animals. And animals, they never ever shit in their own nest. You know? <laughs> they always put the shit elsewhere. So that's my only justification not to do any projects in the, in the Scottish capital. So yes, we started to dream about landscape, which, uh, which is, more about, is more central. It's, it's maybe sometimes even erotic. It's, it, it's, it's about subconscious as well as about the rational side of things. And we, yes, we believe in landscape, we can reconcile opposite forces. And that's, I think, very instrumental about the profession. So yes, on one hand, it's Apollo. It's about rigor and, and, uh, and, and architecture. But it's also about sensuality about hedonism, heat of the moment, extravagant, uh, extravagant uh, and, and uh, like Bach's. Uh, and, and those two opposite forces can be reconciled in, in the profession of landscape. And of course, two other heroes in our, in our spectrum, uh, Dolly the Sheep, uh, the only good thing ever came out of Edinburgh, you know, homemade, uh, completely man-made, uh, fabricated sheep. And, uh, Bobby the Terrier, it's a famous story in, in, in my hometown, uh, who kind of kept on visiting his grave after his owner died uh, for, for many, many years. And of course, he was doing that because every animal in that kind of situation is completely, uh, you know, schizophrenic and confused and uh, it no longer behaves natural. So yes, we believe in opposite forces. Uh, and, uh, but sometimes we also like to make comparison between opposites, like on one hand the jungle and on one hand the city, two photographs by J uh, Joseph Strauss. Uh, but it's not only opposites, it's also got something in common. The city is also like an urban jungle. It grows, it, it grows to the light. It got, you know, look at those buildings. Uh, you, if you look carefully, you can see the different eras mixed up. And, and this idea, we often borrow words from ecology and we superimpose them back onto urbanism. So in, in, in ecology, ecology, if you have a piece of wasteland, the first vegetation is pioneer vegetation and that grows into complexity of, of climate vegetation ultimately. And, and I think cities grow in a similar way from pioneer urbanization to climax urbanization. So, so to look at the city as an urbanistic, urban, uh, as an urban uh, ecological phenomenon is, is interesting. And yes, we are interested in popular culture. And yes, we really like, if possible, to manipulate ma nature. And, and uh, you know, if you can do this funny things, you know, the world could be quite optimistic. 
And uh, the funny thing is about, I mean, every, everybody thinks we are making collages, uh, and, uh, but the reality is that contemporary culture is one collage. Uh, uh, it's a completely overlay of contrasting experiences. Uh, so this is a real photo, uh, quite a, uh, won uh, quite a famous prize two years ago. So yes, some more of our early manifestos. Uh, one of those uh, statements was we like to reveal the layers in the landscape not unlike uh, uh, the uh, seductive actors of Surtees. And as a landscape architect, yes, you have to be seductive like Matahari and you have to be sharp and screwed, screwed as Miss Marple. So another two of our heroes. And, and look at that hat of Miss Marple. It's actually not Miss Marple, but I, in my kind of fantasy, it could be. But, <laughs> but look at that hat. If I only had designed that hat, I could retire. You know, I had, my, <laughs> I had done my contribution to society. It would be finished. It would be, it would be kind of all done. Quickly, some images about the practice, then in more detail, some products. Uh, so yes, our work is about, it's, it's unscrupulous about visualization. It's about landscape is a movable feast of imagery. And in that sense, we quite like to give a modern interpretation of the picturesque uh, movement. Um, and, and, and we're not walking away from that. Uh, originally, landscape, the whole, the whole word of landscape came from people who were painting the landscape before that. Uh, there was no word for landscape. And then, and then the first landscape architect started to build the painting. So you got a kind of reflection, a double reflection, and a box of trickery uh, and illusions started to emerge out of all of that. And we're very fascinated by that. And yes, we do a lot of competitions in order to get uh, some work done. And sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. This one we luckily lost because it was the Princess Diana Memorial Fountain. And was won by Gustafsson and became a very much a political hiccup. But we lost in the first round anyway because we, we put Prince Charles as a silky little boy in a pink shirt in the background. <laughs> and I don't know about America, but the, the British culture on that level is still quite conservative. So <laughs> and yes, yes, we work with artists. This is the ex uh, indeed another example with Mark Dion, uh, the American uh, uh, artist. Mark is a fantastic artist, lives in New York and Philadelphia. Um, I don't know if you know him. Uh, I tried to get him in, in the studio one day here. He, uh, he made a fantastic theory which is called the survival of the cutest. You know, it's only the cute animals who will survive, you know, the Walt Disney lookalikes. Uh, that's contemporary nature. Uh, but this is a project for a vertical garden in the center of London. Uh, a lot of our work is hard landscape, a little urban intervention, urban acupuncture. On all different levels, this is the original drawings for the Brixton Town Hall Square, which is on site right now. Early uh, proposals for some other public spaces like Hackney Town Hall Square. A uh, variety of more green products, park products. This one is close to the Olympic Village. Uh, proposals for, um, in this case, competition for a garden festival in Germany where we very, very reluctant uh, decided not to design the garden festivals but only all the motorways in Germany leading to that garden festival. And uh, an example of one of the many collaborations with Zaha Hadid. Uh, this is the uh, railway station, high speed railway station outside Naples, just below the Vesuvius volcano. And it's of course fantastic to, to bring in the excitement of the volcano into the composition and inspiration for that building. Uh, some studies for revisiting some of the 1960s new towns. This is the communal new town, a fantastic brutalist experiment, a kind of e Italian-esque hilltop town in, in a very drab Scottish context. And uh, we had the idea of uh, overlaying the town with a new concept of new nature. So a new town, new nature. Study from mining areas in Germany, the more the bigger regional scale, the scale I really would like to operate, but still have little opportunity, not much, much, much in invitations. And this is a recent uh, uh, green structure plan for uh, one of the new towns outside Doha. 
which uh, we actually completely out, uh, uh, went outside the brief and, and started to design a green structure which could absorb the future growth of this new town and not just delivering uh, one moment in time as being asked in the brief. And some ideas for the extension of Copenhagen into to its bay. Now this is a picture I really like. This is, uh, this is not Crossmax, I wish it was. This is Sir Abercrombie, 1943. It's about rebuilding London uh, with the idea that the war sh soon should be over. And what I really like about this picture is how the city is being depicted as an organism. That all those, and uh, if you know London, uh, and I'm only starting to s understand London slowly, bit by bit, uh, over many, many years, London is, of course, is a conglomerate of all those villages grown together in this urban constellation. And, uh, but what I, what I like about it, it's, it's again, it's, a, it's like uh, an analogy with nature. And this is, this is, of course, real nature, the cells, and each cell got its own core, its own nucleus, and it communicates on the periphery of the cell to make, you know, to make organisms like that. And that's fascinating. So to, to look to ecology, not just in terms of biodiversity, but a really hardcore ecology to understand uh, urban conditions is interesting. And yes, we like to think about cities as networks. This is, of course, uh, an image of the Situationist. And Guy Debord with his naked city and his idea of psychogeography, the way how you make chunks of images in your mind about urban conditions and, and make your own mental map. And some of our studies for, in this case, Oslo Waterfront, where we started to think about networks and w ways of connecting that urban fabric according to similar lines. And this is not a city, I wish it was. This is a biological diagram uh, about an enzyme to, to make beer, this yeast. Uh, but uh, my God, it could be a fantastic base plan for a city. And uh, some of the studies which we are involved with the Zaha team to start to think about a new kind of urbanism, which of course surpasses the idea of the Cartesian grid into a much more fluid uh, dynamic uh, feel for or urban condition. And, and within this, uh, we, we believe there's a kind of new concept of nature which can overlay that urban condition. And for us, nature, it's, it's a kind of, kind of software which you can download on the hardware, which is the city itself. And yes, we like the idea that we, we, we never talk about nature conservation in, in our office because nature conservation is, is like killing, killing, you know, killing it. Nature is always changing. As soon as you conserve it, try to keep it in, in its one condition, you kill it. Uh, so you have to accept nature is changing. So instead of nature conservation, we, 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 we like to talk about nature activation. How can we create nature as an active act? This is some of the earlier uh, images of some of the students uh, on the bottom of the pile in the studio. Uh, we're working on Boston Bay and do a very forensic exercise for studying all those 30 uh, odd islands in the bay to see if we can connect them into a new ent entity, a uh, kind of modern equivalent of the Emirate necklace of Olmsted here in Boston. So these are some of that uh, uh, early drawings coming out of that studio. Uh, I'll show you now our best project, uh, and, and that's, you know, actually I should stop after that because it only goes downhill, uh, which is a, it's the wrong order to present yourself, uh, but at least it gives you the freedom to escape and do other things. Uh, this is just around the corner where I live in Scotland, so I'm not stupid, you know, it's a reason why I live in Scotland, it's bloody beautiful. Um, and this is the product uh, which I want to talk about. It's about those cubes in this undulating landscape. Now, I have to confess, we didn't design anything, we didn't do anything. This is ecological very sound. Uh, you know, you just don't do anything. Uh, uh, this is a found object, so we adopted the project as our own. Uh, we just documented it and call it our manifesto project, but we didn't do anything. Uh, it's like a piece of land art, you know, there's cubes in this undulating landscape. Of course, it's, uh, it's a slightly different story. It's a, it's a collaboration between uh, Britain and Germany during the Second World War. In this case, the Brits tried to, to stop the uh, possibility of a German landing uh, along this coast. 
So it's a, it's a piece of coastal defense. But if you sound it looking close up, what has happened, and I repeat, this is not designed by nobody, this is just nature, that you've got this little, fantastic little uh, miniature gardens on top of those concrete blocks. Just because wind blows the sand in the air and little birds doing their little shit as well. You know, they don't do it in their nest, they do it on those blocks. And what you get is this, uh, this spontaneous act of nature. Uh, it's like, and, and you've got this beautiful contrast between this Cartesian blocks of warfare and this very fragile nature colonizing it. And we think that's fantastic. I showed this project a year ago in Vienna uh, at a conference. And uh, I must admit that was garden garden conference, which don't go to garden conferences in general. But um, in, thi in this particular conference, all the, all the people started to ask me, how did you do it? And what's your planting plan? And what's your management regime? And we said, you know, they didn't, they didn't, I couldn't tell them that it was just a found object. But anyway, they got Wittgenstein, they got Freud, um, you know, they got their own ways of dealing with those things. So for us, this is a kind of manifesto project, the idea that nature can take over and nature can find its own place quite independently on top of the man-made world. It's not something you have to nurture, it's not something you have to do to be uh, cuddling like a shivering puppy, it's something which is quite independent, fighting its way back. And probably, it ultimately, it got the long, longest breath and started to crack up this urban condition. And if you look in detail, it is fascinating as well. Uh, you probably all know Peter Eisenman, and probably you know the Jewish memorial in, uh, in Berlin. Well, the prototype is beh behind my in my back garden, kind of thing. <coughs> Here it is. Your architect is so easy as well. Yeah. Uh, this is an uh, early study we did for Rotterdam in 2001. This is actually an early Highline project. Uh, it's not as good as uh, field operation, but it was before field operation. Uh, in which we made proposals to, uh, to have an elevated railway line in the city of Rotterdam uh, converted into a raised boulevard with the former railway station not longer in use transformed into a horizontal glass house displaying all the eccentricity of Dutch horticulture. And we had the idea that if we can grow, in Holland, uh, we, we're creating those grotesque tomatoes, really big ones, and they don't taste like anything, but they look big. And, and they, you know, they sell them in all the supermarkets. So if you, can, if you can make grotesque manipulations of fruit and vegetables, you can also do it with flowers. Of course you can. Uh, and in this case, we wanted to have an organic orgy of orchids, uh, grotesquely manipulated into fantastic, strange shapes. And the idea was that at night there would be light sources moving around in this, uh, in this minimalist glass house and creating shadow projections on the outer skin of that glass house. So you've got a kind of movable feast uh, right bang in the city center. And inside you would be overwhelmed and seduced by the perfume. And, but it also it's like a winter garden. It's like the typology of the winter garden like you had in Vienna and Berlin at the end of the 19th century. Uh, this would be a contemporary. So the idea that the whole thing would be a Belvedere, an outlook. Um, uh, from, from this nature uh, into the, uh, the new high rise of Rotterdam. And then that, that elevated line will connect a series of public parks and squares and in itself would be this race promenade. Kind of similar idea, this whole notion is about utilizing old infrastructure for, for new public typologies, uh, public space is interesting. This was a competition we, we regretfully lost. We nearly won, uh, we s literally nearly, nearly won. 60 hectares, right bank, city center of Berlin, on the boundary between the former east and west. So that this railway line was cut off, it was isolated, and, and nature took over. Na nature had its free room for about 40, 50 years to create fantastic recolonized woodland. And now the commission was to make that into a new, uh, a new public park. So this is all about how to use the landscape and the, and the green and the park to stitching the urban fabric back together. 
Uh, it's quite a simple scheme. It's quite big. It's 60 odd hectares. I mean, you're reutilizing this, this spontaneous woodland with, with those lines inspired by the railway lines. They're not flat. They're kind of they're undulated. They kind of shoot, and they become treetop walkways as well. A simple field of meadows uh, for all kind of manifestations and strips of experimental gardens. So the kind of new green machine uh, to uh, reconcile the urban fabric of, of this part of Berlin. And within that, we like to have this, uh, this notion of contrast. I showed you the, the Thomas Truss photographs, but in, in this project, again, we like to reconcile. So on one hand, we're celebrating the, the, the nature the spontaneous nature, but we also like the urban grid on the, on the edge of the park, and this combination, that makes the excitement. Uh, each on its own device would be rather, rather boring, but the, the contrast uh, it gives is, is fascinating. A very early project, uh, when we still had little work in, uh, in Japan, and this was fascinating, because no work, and then suddenly the fax machine goes, and you got a fax completely broken English, if you want to design a, a garden in the Museum of Modern Art in the city of Yamaguchi in Japan. Uh, but no site plans, no budgets, uh, hardly able to understand the brief. So the only, and, and then we got really cold feet, because who dares to design a garden in Japan? We, we dare now, but at those days we were much humble, we didn't. Um, so instead of designing a garden, we designed the two windows of the gallery uh, in the inside uh, the existing gallery. So it's a very simple print, but you've got this strange interrelationship between the real trees and the printed trees. So you've got the strange conditions about uh, its ambiguous kind of nature. And the collaboration with the architect Tenizio Gawa, with some of the, uh, the other elements like this tube, inside the gallery with little videos to explain some of the works. And a, and a more recent project where we really wanted to, uh, to design an experimental glasshouse. And this is a, a glasshouse we built as part of an arts park in Glasgow. And the original idea was um, to collect really weird plants. It is a book, uh, one of my favorite book is, uh, books is a novel. And it's by Hausmann. Hausmann was a decadent author, a Parisian author. Um, and his novel was called Against Nature, which is, of course, a fantastic title for any novel, Against Nature. And the, um, Eisenstein, the, uh, the protagonist of this book, is a, is a rather madman who is obsessive in collecting things. So each chapter he collects something else. In one chapter he collects plants. And you really should read this book because all the plant names, you know, we went to the botanic libraries, and we, all the plants are real plants, but they're all very absurd. They're all selected that they are plants which look artificial, but they are real. And so these are plants with smells of, uh, of death, or they look like sexual organs. They're really the weirdos of the, of the plant kingdom. So we did, we did our homework, we did our plant list, and we wanted to make this weird plant collection. Uh, now that we had to tame down a bit, but we built the project. Uh, it's still a rather kind of mysterious little uh, a plant, plant cabinet of curiosities. Uh, very close to the Charles Rene McIntosh house for an art lover. So we call this the garden for a plant collector. For a plant collector. It's the same notion about the idea of the, this layering, playing with lights and shadows and creating kind of mysterious atmosphere which blurs the boundary between real and, and, and surreal. Now, this, is, uh, this picture I actually took today at the entrance, just, just around the corner here. So I don't know if you should notice this every day or not. Um, this is a good one, because actually, it, again, it proves that all architecture is just derived from, from plants, from nature. And that's you know, something we should not forget. Um, and, and, and we like this notion, and, and, and we use it in some of our products. This, this is uh, a, a small art project we did in, in the city of Liverpool just last year, when the city was capital of culture. 
And we were inspired by those Franciparisian folly gardens. And, and the, the idea that the column, the Greek column, is act, actually, again, uh, the, you know, the columns are based on, on plants and, and uh, you know, trunks of, 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 tr of, 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 uh, of trees, etc. So this idea of uh, reconciling nature and architecture is, is an intriguing one. And so we, uh, this is an early image of this little folly for, it's next to the Rotunda Art Center, so we, that's the reason why we would like to have a Rotunda kind of folly. And uh, here we see some of the early drawings. Yeah, and again, the idea, if you would enter this folly, you would be overwhelmed by a strange experience of plants. And here we see some of the build project. This is uh, it's built as a kind of temporary project. And actually here we've got a mixture of real plants and artificial plants. And I learned a very good lesson here, because all the real plants died, and all the artificial plants are kind of still alive. Uh, so, you know, you learn. Climate change. Climate change is for me this idea of the new sublime, you know. We are interested in the sublime, uh, so what is the sublime in the 21st century is climate change. Um, and we, we have some... <laughs> I have much more of those, but I kind of chucked them out. But uh, this idea that the whole idea of climate and the environment and the planet, it becomes a, a kind of new religion, is, uh, is worrying, it's kind of worrying us. It's, it's a kind of the new new Christianity in, 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 in uh, and, and uh, I don't know. Um, and, and climate change is a kind of funny thing because we all like a bit of change in climate. That's why we go on holidays. That's why we go skiing you know, in the winter. That's why we go on our summer holidays in the sun. Um, and, and we always make kind of fun when we have extreme weather conditions. So, and, and here, here, on, it's Dubai, you know, and of course, what do they want in Dubai? Everything, you, you always want things you don't have, so you want snow. So this is the biggest indoor ski environment in the world, in the desert. And this is the biggest tropical swimming pool in the world, which is in Berlin. So we always want what we don't have. So don't tell me we don't want climate change. I think the change of climate could be very interesting. So, however, we, we, we got our conscious, and, 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 and in order to slightly counterattack global warming, we have the idea we should do little projects about local freezing. So global warming, local freezing. And this was a proposition to, uh, along the coast in Scotland to, uh, to have an iceberg, a permanent iceberg, which would be refrigerated by a nuclear power station uh, on, the, on the far end of that slide. But more interesting where we stand at the moment um, it's, it, this is the holy grail of geology. This is where James Hutton, and again, he's once one of those Enlightenments, same, same era, friends, uh, you know, drinking partners with David Hume and uh, Adam Smith. Uh, and James Hutton, he discovered geological time. And he found the visible evidence of this discovery uh, right on this spot we're standing here, Sicker Point. And I found it fascinating, the concept of ge geological time. And again, if I want to make a differentiation between architecture and landscape, architecture is all about time. So landscape is all about time. And to understand time, a variety of times, from the long time scale to the heat of the moment, the short uh, rupture, is, is understanding landscapes. So he had this theory of unconformity. And here he is. And, and you know, now it's easy to talk about, but in his day, you know, talking about that the world has no beginning, no end, is a continuous process of transformation, and that's, of course, essence of landscape. That, of course, uh, was maybe not uh, as easy to be accepted by uh, certain parts of more religious backgrounds. And there's no doubt that James Hutton paved the way for people like Charles Darwin uh, to, to proclaim their theories. And this is one, uh, one of the illustrations in one of his books and I, I really like this because you've got this only very thin layer of, of cultivation, of, of culture, and it is boiling, bubbling nature sitting there waiting to erupt. Um, I like that really kind of strange feel of that. 
and here close up to that power station, which sits very kind of um, interestingly, you know, opposite this point where geological time was being discovered. So here are some of the images about the product. It's a very simple notion. Iceberg uh, melted, or, or sorry, uh, frozen by the nuclear power station. It's a bit like a fritz in your kitchen. If you want to cool something down, you generate heat. The, the, the heat we generate, we pump in some old limestone quarries. Uh, because of the lime, you would have beautiful uh, light blue water. And you've got this climate interchange of, 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 of the icebergs and, 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 the, and the near tropical lagoon. But interestingly enough, when on, on the site itself, it's, it's actually a landscape shaped by the forces of the melting ice after the ice age. But on the limestone outcrops uh, in the beach, you find tropical uh, fossils. So it's, you know, it's not a major story. This landscape was once tropical and was once covered by ice. You know, climate change, climate has always been changed. Don't worry, I really would be worried if climate st suddenly started to stop changing because that means the machine would have been, uh, been stopped or being disrupted. The whole idea, to give it a, a bit of an additional meaning, we thought, well, maybe we should make it an, into a national monument after done all the effort. So it would be a national monument of the unconsciousness of the Scottish psyche. So we're freezing up all this kind of repressed, I don't know if you know, Scottish culture is quite repressed. <coughs> uh, uh, and so we got a Pandora box if this effort would be uh, defrosted. A series of more of our, of our built products, some of the more uh, urban conditions. Uh, this was more commercial work, uh, but kind of intriguing. If, in this kind of work, we, we like to be a bit more modest, you know, like, like the urban conditions where you got the, the sublime future system building, the Gothic church, very mediocre commercial architecture. It's more about trying to, uh, to mediate between those extremes. Some little notions about making connections, this, this movable art sculpture we designed with Peter Fink, the artist, is exactly the same height as the spire of the church, used to create kind of urban connections. And the idea of combining green and hard landscape to create specific conditions. One of the artworks we, uh, we designed for this space Stacked glass with water running over it and light shining through. A little project for a, uh, a rather cheap project for a, a garden in the outskirts, of, sorry, in the, in quite in the, in, the, in the city center of Glasgow, owned by the university. And this was intriguing because for the first time we were asked to demolish a building in order to create a landscape. Now, often it's the other way around, you know. Architects come along, they destroy a landscape, and we can clean up the mess. Um, here we could, you know, here we could demolish a building in order to create a landscape. It's a bit like sweet revenge. <laughs> and it's quite nice to demolish a building and to have some, something to say of how you demolish it and what, what element you could recover from the site or could even keep as little follies uh, on, onto that site. And here we seeing that this product is again, it's about connectivity, uh, creating different conditions, using, using the level difference a bit like the urban project before in Birmingham to create a kind of theoretical effect, combining layers of old and new. And funny enough, about this project, the dean of the university said, yes, I like your project very much, I, we're going to build it, but we have one problem. And the problem was is that that the girl was too sexy. <laughs> uh, uh, and so we had to replace the girl. And we did replace the girl with a Scottish, you know, uh, Scottish little boy with, with spots, greasy hair, very thick glasses. <laughs> and somehow that was okay. <laughs> so if you ever want to go on student exchange, go to Strathclyde University in Glasgow. Some of the ideas of reshaping that uh, steep site and utilizing the south-facing slope, some of the inspiration in some of the construction. 
where we literally reutilized breaking down the, uh, the sandstone of the, uh, of the hospital and reutilized them in the, in the gabions to give structure to the site. Otherwise, a very simple scheme, uh, where it's very robust, simple materials like the willows, the hadera, ground cover, the grasses, the birds, we just to create a simple, quick impact in this quite harsh condition. And it's occupied by sinus, which is quite a nice, uh, nice effect. Down on the, on the bottom of the slope, we, we turn more to nature. We're collecting the water, and suddenly we uh, we introducing a, a feeling for nature in the city. And in the summer, it's often being used as open air cinema. A slightly more upmarket version of a small kind of pocket park is the one we did in, in London next to the Tower Bridge, next to the GLA headquarters designed by Norman Foster and opposite the Tower of London. And this, this, this notion, oh, this is some slide in the wrong, oh, aha. Uh -huh. I have to wait for that project, it comes a bit later. Um, First, the Royal Festival Hall. This is only a, a bit upstream of the same river in the same centre of London. It's the Royal Festival Hall. And uh, it's, I like to work on this project because it's my, literally my fam most favourite building in London. It's a 1950s modernist building on the river, built as part of the Festival of Britain. And what I like about the building is that the building itself is a public space. There's not many theatres which are public space in their own right. Often you have to buy a ticket to enter. Here, the theater is a box in a box, and uh, in, a, in, a, in a space in between, you can wander around, connect with different levels, and have different views across the river uh, and back, uh, back into London. This is what we saw when, the, when we started the project. The relationship between this beautiful building and the river was completely lost. Brutalist 1960s interventions, a slip road, a dark on the belly of the building, a mean strip of grass. Um, but what we discovered uh, in this condition is that the curve of the building is exactly the same curve as the river. So it's not just one of those modernistic buildings, it's actually a very clever building which relates very well to, the, to its topographic uh, matrix. So what we try to do in the project is very simple to reinstate the curves in order to create a relationship again between the building, the landscape and, and the river beyond. So we took away the roads that is now old terraces, new functions we designed with the architects in the underbelly of the building, and a big flight of steps which could be used for all kinds of events to mediate between the savvy private and the public. And so, and so again, these projects are relatively simple, uh, and if you would be on site, you probably hardly would notice the kind of project in, in its own right. And, uh, Although it sounds like contradictions, I think there are certain projects with which you actually can be quite modest as a lack of architect and just concentrate on some of the materiality and the details, uh, which could be. No, here we got the slightly the, the columns slightly angled as a remnant of that garden of the Festival of Britain in the 1950s. And this was the condition in front of the theater before we started the project and we reclaimed that space into a new public square. This is back to that park, a bit more, a couple of, uh, probably one mile downstream, but still in the center of London. And this is called Pottersfield Park, so this was a field of, potter, of pottery. And we did our homework and, and we talked to the archaeologist and we found little evidence of all this beautiful imitation Dutch blue, uh, Delft blue uh, pottery. And that became kind of influenced to some of the details. The other things which I have to say is, you know, I come from Holland and in Holland we think we are so liberal and democratic 
But actually, as designers, we're all very arrogant. You know, we've got the Ram Kohlhaas and the Adi and Gozes of West Aid Hall, Empire Adi Field, all quite, um, you know, egocentric kind of uh, designers. Uh, and what, what really surprised me about the London context, and there was a talk by Ricky Bedette yesterday, I don't know what he talked about, I wasn't there, but uh, London. <laughs> In, in uh, the, the condition about, uh, about London is, all the public projects are endless process of public consultations and, uh, and, and talking to the public. And in, in a funny way, we quite like that. We think that in, in, in certain conditions that could be beneficial and, and can, can be fun. Um, so, but it, it makes a way of working different. You have to be more communicating and, and drawing in a way that, that you and build models in a way you can communicate your early ideas. So this simple neighborhood park is more like a hottest conclusive. It's more the size of, of, a, of, a, of a city garden. And, and we wanted to treat part of that as a garden and give the intensity of a garden. And we worked with the Dutch plantsman Pete Oudorf as part of the project. It's the same Pete Oudorf who designed uh, the planting for the High Line in, in New York with field operation. And some of the images of that project is simple, uh, intensely designed neighborhood park which opens up into those fields with cascades down and, and steps down. And actually, uh, it's again a Belvedere viewing platform where the real project is about the skyline of London across the River Thames. The idea that space can be used for, for events, uh, so it's got this notion of chains. Also quite interesting is that the reason that we could do a project like this is to, uh, and that is a kind of other achievement, it's not so much design, is that we made the park into a trust. So the, the park's actually run by the residents in combination to business people. And, and it means that they can appoint their own head gardener and uh, they can create their own revenues which then can be reinvested in the park itself. Some of the planting of Pete Oudorf, which is a fantastic uh, display of herbaceous plants. This really is about the texture and the way how it changed to the seasons and got a sense, a sense of spatial quality, architectural quality throughout the year. And this collaboration with Pete Oudorf has becomes now quite important in our practice. At the moment, we have this project in Japan, in the Netherlands, and one in Germany, all in the same combination of us as designers and Pete as, as making the planting. But it's also kind of, although we're both Dutch, it's a kind of giving the Brits what they really like. If they have a sense of flowers and, and sense of nature in Britain, it's really, uh, and, and they really appreciate it. And they never realized that you actually could create those things in public landscapes in the urban environment. Of course, Pete Oudorf also worked on the Millennium Park in Chicago with uh, Catherine Gustafson. And some of those detailings of the original pottery we found on site, in this case the cast iron fence around the park at the entrance of the park. This is one of the examples of um, the collaboration with Zaha it's the B&W factory in Leipzig in Germany. It's a 250 hectare site. It's a competition we won together and uh, we kind of built together a first collaboration of, of many. Um, it's a factory, so the, a lot of the landscape here we see would see the end states where there would be a lot of uh, uh, factory space. So part of the landscape was temporary landscapes, but also it's about the seniography of arrival and the Zaha building is a little zigzag in the, in, the, in the top center. The rest is designed by engineers, not by architects. And so it's a sense of arrival moving to that central building and dispersing into uh, the site itself. Um, obviously, the collaboration with Zaha is for us very interesting because Zaha's work is all about abstraction of nature. So it comes very close to where we want to be as landscape architects. 
And we believe our best buildings are the horizontal buildings, the building which comes out of the landscape. We, we sometimes now we work on high rise with Zaha and it's disastrous. It's just, uh, how, can you know, how can you make a relationship between a high rise tower and a piece of, you know, and then Zaha tries to make little dips and little, and it just doesn't work. Um, you, know, you better put those towers horizontal and then it is more interesting. So endless studies uh, in a way of making a kind of scenography, a sense of arrival. And, um, and this, but this was a site. And the, the German engineers, before we started the projects, had been a bit over eager. So they had made the site completely flat. Now, I'm from Holland. I love flat. You know, give me anything flat. I love it. But there is flat and flat. And this is completely flat. Now, if you've got 250 hectare, hectares completely flat, how do you drain it? I promise you, it's impossible. And the other thing they have done, which was quite funny, uh, they thought, oh, this BMW car factory, and BMW do, is all those beautiful cars and uh, prestigious. Uh, they cannot have foundations which will freeze up in the winter in Leipzig, so we put antifreeze in the ground. But it's quite a clever idea, because that means that the only vegetation which grows here would be a kind of rare alpine vegetation, you know, like pH level 11, 12. And I quite like rare alpine vegetation. But the problem was that all the discussions with the city council of Leipzig, the planning department, and I called them, uh, and that's my only claim to fame I can make in my profession, I, I called them ecological Taliban, uh, because that's what they were. And they insisted that we only could use German native plants and trees on this site. Now, I'm very worried about this thing, because I don't know if you know your history, but if there's any country who discovered nature, conservation, um, it was Germany in the 1930s. The whole notion about identity because of your native vegetation is very dodgy, politically completely incorrect. You know, we live in a hybrid society where everything is mixed and, and, and um, so, uh, and of course, yeah, you know, I was really, how do you say it, uh, very angry about this uh, restriction. Especially, we, we had a certain idea of how to, uh, how to go about the site. And one of those ideas, here's some of the ideas of the buildings and the abstraction of it. One of the ideas is that we want to have those tree planting with the planting distances getting closer and closer and closer and closer. It's inspired by the acceleration of the car being produced in this car factory. So you get this kind of strange sense of dynamic arrival. And in order to express that, we needed trees in this kind of shape and size. And there's probably only two trees, this Italian poplar and maybe a cultivar of the oak. Um, so we wanted to have Italian poplars. And the ecological Taliban said, Nein, keine populieren, because they're not native. You know, the name already says Italian, you know, it's not Germany. Uh, so we were not allowed to plant Italian poplars in Germany. And it's only after a hard uh, fight I found this beautiful image. Because I do my homework, uh, I, I, we, I, we're quite fanatic about the products. And this is what I found in an old bookshop. It's a, it's a, it's a beautiful engraving and drawing about uh, the city of Leipzig in the periphery where we are, roughly where the factory is being built. And what do we see? What do we bloody see? Huh? <laughs> Fucking Italian poplars. <laughs> So you had to see the smile on my face when I went to this big planning meeting with the ecological Taliban and tried to explain the difference that this is maybe not a nature, but at least it's a cultural landscape. And it did the trick. We built the product accordingly. Some of the ideas, of course, this notion about Zaha, it's, it's, uh, Zaha is all about uh, movement and then the idea that uh, the language of her designs shoots out of the building into the landscape. And further away from the factory, it's more the, based on the agricultural landscape. Um, and some of the drawings, or some of the buildings, uh, completely surreal buildings where the, where the cars, the manufactured cars, are transported above the head of the workers, the typists sitting in this space. Here. And some of the building. try to go a bit quicker, there's one project, another project, which we at least had the opportunity to work on the urbanistic scale with the Zaha team. This is Bilbao, the project is the peninsula island on top of the slide, 64 hectares, uh, to be changed in mixed urban development. 
fascinating for us to be, you know, it's for us it's so important to be at the start of projects, otherwise uh, all is lost. And here, in this kind of dynamic uh, environment of the river, which is tidal and prone to flooding, we really had something to say about how to design a piece of urban fabric in, the, in this natural landscape. In fact, we advised the client in the first meeting not to build the project. This, is, again, is quite a nice thing because it, it solves a lot of hassle. Uh, but I still got the bruises of the Zaha, you know, on my, on my leg when it was kicking under the table because I told the client not to build in the floodplain. But it literally would have been the end of the project. Anyway, we, we continued, we struggled on, and, and we said, well, if it's about, if you're going to build it, you really have to understand the, the dynamic nature of that uh, floodplain landscape. Uh, this is some of the works of the Zaha team, which is first fascinating, because it's actually very dodgy. It's actually, I would never ever recommend this to any students. Don't do this at home. Don't do this in your studio. I think Zaha can handle it, because he is, you know, she and her team, is, it's really, they're, they're really skilled. But what they're doing is, they forget about the program. It's not about the program. It's not about the brief. It's not about the circulation diagrams and all this. It's about a piece of modification, which is much more closer to sculpture, and looking to the forces in the landscape, which could influence the shape and, and the configuration of that. Of that uh. And actually, it's not a bad thing, because functions in cities always change anyway. And uh, so why should you use function as your main criteria to design a city? Um, but they also take it uh, very serious. So this, this is a process of hundreds and hundreds of models, and the, the, ultimately the refinement, of course, the functions are being squeezed in and are being resolved, and, and you get fantastic tensions and uh, really interesting urbanism. Uh, and, and so much of the urbanists I work with, they're still working with the diagrams, um, and, and, and they only start to think about the third dimension at the very end of the project. This is completely the other way around. It starts with the third dimension, and the plans emerge afterwards. And of course, we could start to think how to think about nature, the edge conditions, the tidal ranges, different sources of water from sweet water, salt water, brackish water, collecting the rainwater from the urban area, uh, bring them down to the river, weaving the landscape into this uh, new kind of urbanism and thinking about new typologies of, of green incubators which help to clean up the water and create a kind of contemporary ecology as antidote for this city. I'm not nearly finished. This is literally the last, uh, the kind of last part. Um, and this is the notion that that the idea of landscape, the idea of the garden, is actually, after all those years, actually quite an interesting notion. So when I was a student, we were not allowed to talk about gardens. Uh, that was something, you know, for, you know, uh, for, for completely out of the field of landscape architecture. But if you want to see landscape as a form of art, then the garden is, of course, a fantastic experiment. And I even go as far as by, by saying that I think the garden could be the new prototype of how to design a city. So these are the things uh, which have been always on the back of our mind in many of our projects. And, and now our latest project is to, uh, to, oops, sorry, to work on the Kew Gardens, the 120 uh, grand old lady of botany in the outskirts of London. is of course, a fantastic project to think about what is nature in the 21st century, and how can we revamp a kind of prehistoric botanic garden into the 21st century. The reason why we got the product is, is that because we thought we never would get the product in the first place. So when we came for interview, we just told them everything that was wrong with the garden, and it somehow did the trick. And one of the things which we think is wrong is that this 120 hectares has completely turned its back towards the river. And, uh, and, and all, all what we wanted to do as part of a project is to reinstate the relationship between the garden and, and the river. And that's not only for historic reasons, the Acadian landscape, it's also uh, biodiversity reasons, and of, of course the sheer visual pleasure of, of, of that condition. This is an early painting uh, taken from the gardens in the 18th century, and, and this is one of the spots in the garden which is nearly uh, very similar, it's, it's, if it's not changed. 
And there's not many places in London where you've got historic landscapes on both sides of the River Thames. So you certainly are, uh, f this only, only what reminds you about the cities uh, is it's the planes landing in Heathrow Airport. Uh, but when we started to do this research, this is one of the few projects where we really have time to do research. We started to do amazing discoveries. And some of those discoveries literally give me shivering knees. I still have sleep this night about them. And as some of the discoveries I have not even told or client, I don't know how to tell them. Because this garden is uh, much less innocent than it looks like. It's the origin is two royal gardens. Uh, uh, one designed by Britsman, uh, followed up by uh, Capability Brown and William Kent. The other one by William Chambers. But they were royal gardens. <laughs> And there was also an observ observatory where they were studying the stars as well. And what we're starting to discover is that there is an incredible geometric relationship, not only between this garden, but the, uh, the other uh, uh, English landscape gardens in this uh, Acadian landscape. And, and the pagoda plays an important role in that as well. And it's all based on symmetry, uh, it, it golden section proportions, and the whole, the whole lot. Um, and in a funny way, that makes this garden quite awkward because in, in spatial terms, it's, it's a rather a mess. It's only strange underlying relationships we, we discovered. We've done our homework in a project like this. We have to be craftsmen. We, you know, we really do endless measured drawings to draw that landscape um, and really do in-depth research. And it's fantastic. This is William Chambers, you know, with all those follies, with all having their meaning, symbology, but they're all sitting in a matrix, uh, which is all based on very, very fascinating relationships. And from the pagoda, we we having radius. We're looking to royal palaces, all exactly of the similar distances, uh, located from the very centre of the pagoda itself. <coughs> so some of that research, which is ongoing, and the idea, what this kind of geometric uh, network actually entails and how it relates to observatories and, and research they did about the constellations of the stars and the transit of Venus, which took place only once in the 400 years. It took place exactly at the time, the reason why they built the observatory in the garden. Uh, and we started to unravel, and, and this is like the layers which I talked about in the beginning, unraveling the layers of a garden, unraveling how the different transformations actually uh, play with a certain kind of ongoing design matrix. And this is just a set of early drawings for this project, in which we're trying to reinstate the relationship with the river, bringing a new sense of uh, typology of nature. Uh, started to think about the possibility of a footbridge to link to the estate, also designed by Capability Brown on the other side of the river and just literally celebrating nature in its full glory. This is very back to my uh, home country, which uh, after a long journey in exile, I, I now also have a little uh, hideaway in the Netherlands, and this is just around the corner of my house on an island in the Netherlands. And this project, the last project, is all about light. And it's only now I feel a bit more confident to do projects in the Netherlands. Um, and yes, I talked about Joseph Boyce, but these are more recent photographs. This is the dike. These are not photographs by myself, but this is the dike to the island uh, where, where I have my little property. And it's a fantastic way of the Dutch light is actually still quite fascinating. So the product, the last product is the Zyde Z Museum. It's also the little animation uh, outside is part of that project. It's a cultural museum where they collect old artifacts of Dutch culture. Our project is a triangular piece of land surrounded on three sides by water, the harbor, the nature reserves, and the open lake. And all what we try to do in this project is try to capture that slide. And so at the far end of this triangular piece of uh, peninsula, we're creating water basins. They're all slightly different depths. Some of them are, are dark peat. Other ones are white seashells. They're very shallow. And, and the idea is that they give a palette of the different light conditions in the Netherlands in a kind of intriguing way. So it's a kind of trying to collect light and light conditions. So 
And I think there's a little animation that maybe could be shown if there's somebody in the back of the box. Uh, and otherwise, thank you for your patience. Take some questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you all. Are there uh, any questions or comments? Yeah, there's a little video. I don't know. It's some, is, it, is there somebody there too? No, 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 no. I don't know what happens with the video. They, uh, they told me they could install it on the back, but I don't know if they still it. I'll try the video, I'll see what it's... Yeah, it's, it should be installed there. Somebody has to push a button. It's a, the, the, the idea about the video is well, it's actually it's just a series like this one outside. But it, it's, but it's quite ex on a personal level, feel quite excited for us. It's like the new move. It's kind of trying to break away from the two-dimensional image and try to to really capture ideas about light and movement as a, as a way of how to project our works. So it's kind of no, somebody left there. Okay, fair enough. No big problem. I always there. Yes. Compulsive question. I think I think one of the things that is obviously very um, very um, evident in the work is the way in which you're fascinated with the whole issue of alternative modes of representation. So while there are certain instances where you use conventional drawings, in other things, a lot of the time, you're actually trying mm. uh, very particularly to, to look in different ways. And, and you made this uh, emphasis about the temporality mm. of landscape and the role of time. And, and one can see that in the series of photographs. But I'm just wondering whether you can speak now more broadly about the status of representation within the field of, of landscape. Mm. Um, um, and, you know, what you see as potential areas of exploration, what are your thoughts and reflections specifically about this, this particular topic? Because I think it's, 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 a, it's a critical issue for us mm. here in the school, and I'm sure for a lot of it, 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 of, it's, a it's, a, it's a difficult one, and I had just an interesting discussion with, with uh, James Corner from Field Operation only two days about the same issue, and because we're also getting very worried, because when we started to make certain kind of images ten years ago, all right, they were kind of hot, and now every mediocre commercial practice, they're starting to do similar kind of things, although I believe still not in the same way, but it's becomes probably for client very similar and, and one of a kind. On a more artistic way, I, 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 I think the world of landscape architecture, uh, if you take Great Britain, if you, if you really think what comes out of Great Britain as a, as, a, as, a, as a culture, I think the landscape style is probably the only original contribution. Which I really could truly say, what is original coming from Great Britain in terms of art? It's probably the landscape art. Other you know, paintings, architecture done before. What was new was landscape art. So I think, uh, and this was not the way how I could talk when I was a student. You know, we were very much trained in a way. My professor was educated as one of the first by Ian McHarg. It was, you know, art was forbidden fruit not to be talked about. Uh, you could not use the word beauty in a creative. If I would use the word, I do this because it's beautiful, you would be wiped out. So I think it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an acknowledgement that, that the, the pic pictorial representation, it's, it's, it's coming links us to the world of art and, and landscape is so close to that. And this notion of how do you 
picture the landscape is fascinating. You know, I'm, I'm fascinated that already in, in the 17th, 18th century, yet is what they call the, the cloud glasses, the cloud Laurent, they wear these brown glasses. So you go to the landscape with an artifice and you look backwards to see the landscape through kind of rose colored, or in this case, brown colored tinted glasses because it gives a more artistic impression. Well, that's fantastic, and that's the kind of early uh, version of what we're doing now with um, the multitask mobile phone or with the camcorders. <coughs> we're living in a still this visual culture where we're screening the landscape uh, as, a, as a way of, you know, you screen it. And, and now, more interesting, we're living in the, what I call the Google Earth generation. So it's a kind of divine eye, nearly a godlike eye, which we have to look down and it's fantastic. Google Earth is really changing. That is the revolution in my profession is Google Earth. I've done projects with I've never been to sites. You know, I, I, I made proposals for the whole of the Dead Sea, 160 kilometers for the Jordanese government, just from Google Earth, you know, just Googling. Um, and, uh, but I think those things are related because they are related to a certain uh, uh, idea of visuality and how do you visually represent. Um, but I, I don't want to make it you know, the problem is you should not make it cheap. You should not say, oh, landscape is just fancy because it's about an image. I think, of course, it's more, more than imagery. But I think the image, we often say that it's not an, art, it's not an artist's impression. It, it's, an, it's, an expo, it's, an art, it's an It's an exploration. The image is explorative. It's a mental image. And that's a big difference compared to architects we work with including the Zaha teams, by the way, even Zaha, because they do all everything on Rhino and it's on Google, you know, Rhino. But even, they, they, was, even they, they themselves these days, because they're so bloody busy, they go to professional uh, people making the final renderings and things like that. Uh, and we tend to make the image first. We don't make it, and that's serious what we do. So the image is the reference point for the project. That's also why I can escape and be here, because if the image is kind of conceived, then that is the kind of reference for, for the team to work on. Uh, so yeah, that's some, those are some of the notions in not really answering your question, but it was too difficult as a question. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. Can I ask a question, even if yes, holding yeah. the mic? <laughs> huh? um, I was just sort of interested in the, let's say, the, the Dutch notion of architecture and, let's say, its relationship, or if it's even there in the discussion for landscape. Sort of the idea of, a, let's say, like a, the clever approach to thinking about program or thinking about a problem. Well, there, there, there is there isn't quintessential Dutchness, which I kind of like, but you, has, you have to dilute it with other things. That's what, what, you, what you kind of refer to when we, in our office we talk about the British sense of humor and the German sense of rigor. If you just got the Dutch uh, sense of conceptualism and experiment, it, my gosh, uh, I'm not sure. It's, it's, it was interesting when I was attending this, this when you're having your optional studios, there were these presentations of all my colleagues of studio Tutors. And it was, and, and, and what I was missing there was the Dutch attitude. So we've seen the kind of AA attitude of the, 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 the way of the shapes and form and, and, uh, and, and really go into the depth exploration of that, or we're seeing the kind of uh, ease or conscious and go to certain countries and do projects. Um, but we didn't saw the Dutch cleverness of conceptual thinking. Somehow it doesn't seem to um, have invaded Harvard. Um, and I, but there is something there which I still quite like, the, the purity of the, it's only the dirt who can have this kind of go so banal into the abstract of a, of a concept and just go with it. Um, and, 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 and they get away with it. It's fantastic. You know, in terms of build quality, in terms of architectural quality, a lot of the dirt stuff is not that interesting. But as a thought process, it's, yeah, I... I, I and I'm convinced, I mean, I know it's said many times before by other people, I'm convinced it's to do with the Dutch landscape. You know, it's keeping, it, it's, you have to, you know, it's, it's a Dutchness, it's an attitude and a sense of equality. 
uh, and, and the idea that you can make things and that you can discuss it, which is completely embedded in the landscape you, you're being brought up with. And I had kind of, you know, love-hate relation. I, I also found it a bit depressing as well. Um, uh, but being now working in Great Britain, I really miss that. You know, there is no sense of urbanism in Great Britain. They have not this kind of clever conceptual thinking which can deal with complexities like cities. You know, Britain got fantastic architects, but there's really no urbanism of any interest. And, and the Dutch, you know, Ram Kolas, Arjen Geus, Kees Christian, so they really can handle that. And that's why, why I think the Dutch are better on that level even than on the real, you know, if you want to have a beautiful piece of architecture, you have to go to, to Swiss, you know, not to Holland. I have a question for you. Right. Oh, no. Then it is, uh, it's, it's, it's all the... I have lots of questions, <laughs> but um, can you maybe talk about the, the relationship between the, the work and the practice and, and the research you do with Gross Max and, and the academy, how you teach in studio? What is, what is the relationship between... Well, I, 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 I did a lot of teaching. I, I, I taught actually very early after I graduated, so I've been teaching nearly 18 years at the School of Art. And the reason why I went to the School of Art in Edinburgh, uh, so it was not totally true by saying that it was so great of not having any work, because of course I made a living by teaching um, as well. But, um, but I was teaching at the School of Art because I really thought, you know, I was bloody trained at the Agricultural University. Can you imagine, you know, farmers' sons and daughters surrounding you, and you know, the, we were the odd one out. You know, you guys, landscape architects, in these situations are the odd one out because they're boring and things like that. But we were the kind of weirdos in the Agricultural University, and that, and that was actually quite good because you had to find your way out. Um, but but the idea that I, I could teach my profession at the School of Art was very fascinating, and surrounded by architects and artists that would be for me in my innocent uh, ideals that would be the place for me to be. Now the reality was it wasn't like at, at all like that. The artists and the architects were, had, were completely different departments, no relationships whatsoever. And I, 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 uh, one of the few ex uh, achievements I had is that I made a change of that. I made a new program that was called Art, Space, Nature, in which we got people who already got a qualification in art or architecture or design and we got students from all over the world uh, doing this two-year postgraduate program. And, that, that's, uh, that's, and that's only for the last five years I was doing that. And uh, there we started to, to do much more experiment in how you could blur the boundaries. Uh, but, I, but it's on the basis that you, you, each person has his own profession. I don't like the idea that I'm an artist or I'm an architect. You, you have to have an own profession. But if you have and if you're self-assured about your profession, than to collaborate with other professions. It's, it's, uh, and uh, this was all about collaboration. Um, so yes, no, teaching has been uh, uh, important because it's not only a way of living, but it's, 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 it, it keeps your office free from a lot of bullshit. I think that was important for us. You know, we didn't do the car parks, we didn't do the commercial projects for a long, long time. And, and I think that is actually the biggest impact for me with the teaching. I, I, I bought freedom uh, in my practice uh, because not all my money was dependent on, on that practice. But did you teach how you practice? What was the relationship with the well, uh, ooh, uh, I'm not a priest. Uh, <laughs> do, you, do you teach as you... I don't know. I mean, uh, the, the teaching for me, I, mean, I, 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 I said it to the students, I mean, we talked about James Corner, we had a little discussion, you know, that James Corner, Pan Landscape Architecture, I think is one of the best places to be at the moment in this country in my profession. But then, at the same time, my gosh, they all look alike, the students, you know, all the portfolios are very good, but they all look alike. So then I think educational-wise, that's not good. Um, so I, know, I think education is getting the best out of students, and it's not about your own practice. I actually don't talk too much about my own practice uh, when I was teaching, and I was definitely had no inclinations to make certain kind of schools in that respect. Yeah. Chris, your, uh, your practice is one that really revels, <coughs> revels in the botanical, and is quite unique that way, yes. I think. Um, Talk, uh, and yet there's a clear interest in the urban as well. 
And uh, so talk about this relationship, the tensions, the botanical, the urbanism. I think your studio is starting to address this. Well, uh, about, about, about I'm not sure how much we know uh, about plants and botany, but, the, but because of, by coincidence of some of our projects, it's now fantastic to really work with, you know, if I talk to the people in queue, uh, with 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 our aesthetically completely uh, having had deprived childhoods kind of thing, but um, but they're really fantastically knowledgeable about about the vegetation and and because that kind of scientific attitude to botany, it's it's all about understanding that things are changing and that you have to work with time and the long times and 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 so so that so the the, the affinity is actually quite. Quite there, and I think, I really think this idea of, of not, you know, often in the landscape projects, the master plan is is already obsolete. You know, we know that it doesn't work like that. You know, climate will change, conditions will change, storms will pass by, so we have to go with the flow. We have to uh, much more uh, finding a different way of, of attitude, and I think that way of of responding is very topical for urbanism. And yes, you know, I'm an external examiner at AAA in London where they've got landscape urbanism as a program. And on one hand, I think it's fantastic because those enthusiastic, talented young students driven by fantastic tutors to do fantastic things which really blow my mind. But actually, actually, if you really look, there are big, uh, big patterns, uh, uh, you know, enlarged over, over the urban territory. So this idea of urban landscape urbanism, and then Waldheim is, I think, the inventor of this word, which should have been forbidden. It's, you know, we should never ever, you know, it, it's, uh, because it's a kind of, it, it sets the wrong footing. Um, but I think landscape, and, and that's then important. What is important also if I work with Zaha or Chipperfield or Fosses, of course, I have to make myself a reason to be part of the team. And those people can design, of course, uh, but they don't know about plants and botany, and about time and process, and, and a different kind of scale. Most architects you kind of never understand the scale of the landscape. So I think we have something to offer. And I think the idea of the, uh, uh, those elements about vegetation and process, it's, it's so topical for urbanism. Uh, but I must admit, we have very little opportunity to operate on that level. I, 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 uh, maybe in the Netherlands I would, but not, not in Britain. It's really a tough, uh, tough go. Continuing in the same question, you mentioned in one of your project of contemporary ecology as antidote for the city. Yeah. So how do you picture landscape in the contemporary city so that the city stops needing antidotes? Well, it, well, the antidote is literally the, uh, it's the idea that you need the contrast and, and uh, something which kind of uh, gets things out of, the, uh, out of your toxic. Uh, and we, we, we really once did a kind of, it's a stupid word and I have to apologize, but we, we, another intervention beside the ecolo ecological Taliban was the concept of ecological wonder bra. And, and the idea that the ecological wonder bra would kind of uplift nature in fragile urban conditions. Um, but, it, it, but it is fascinating. I, I, I think the idea um, that the antidote, so that, that I mean, Boston is fascinating for me, because Boston you got Olmstead with the emerald necklace, and I, I often used still, I mean, the students are getting bored with me because that is so old hat, Olmstead. But the guy was incredibly clever of using you know, green and, and landscape uh, as, a, as, a, as an urban cleansing mechanism. So it was a way of dealing with the metabolism of a city. Um, and these kind of things, uh, it's a master sitting on the front row in, in that, uh, which I only could, which I could close to that. But I think that is very interesting. I, so the idea of really understanding nature as, as a way um, in that respect. Uh, so it's not only about aesthetics, it's not only about beauty. It's, it's, I sometimes say, let nature work hard for its money. And uh, Do you guys have Bob the Builder? Is that Bob the Builder? It's, you know, I got a small kid, Bob the Builder, yeah? And his statements, you know, can we fix it? Yes, we can. 
That's, that's the kind of right attitude in, for ecology. Can we fix it? Yes, we can. It's going to pop the builder. Thank you. Just just before, uh, as you go out, you may want to look at the video that's on the current wall. Uh, that uh, is a substitute for the video we didn't see tonight. Yeah, that was a bit more funky one, but that's yeah. a bit, don't worry. Uh, but also to thank uh, Elko for his presentation tonight. Thank you.